This is a short video about the fundamental theorem of calculus in the first form. And so to set this stuff up, we're pretty far into Riemann integrals right now. Um, so the next thing I want to tell you about to build up to this first form of the fundamental theorem of calculus is what an antiderivative is. So uh, given a function, little f or lowercase f from this interval uh, a to b with closed brackets here, um, from a, b to r, we're gonna call another function capital F an antiderivative of little f on that interval from a to b if the derivative of capital F is equal to f for all x in the domain of little f. So again, we'll call capital F an antiderivative if his derivative is little f. All right, some, some notation that we're also gonna utilize in this section is this bar with the b, a on f, what that tells me to do is to plug b into f and then subtract what I get when I plug in a. So again, this notation here, think of f of b minus f of a. And an alternative notation that some books might use is instead of the bar, they use brackets here, and then b and a at the top and at the bottom. It means the same thing though. Um, what I will stick to for this video at least is this top notation here. But if you like that one better for your class and your professor's cool with that, then use that. All right, so what is the first form of the fundamental theorem of calculus? So here goes. So suppose first that there exists a finite set E contained inside your interval from A to B. Let's change this to yellow. Uh, such that, oh, sorry, and two functions. So first of all, I've got a finite set of points in my interval from A to B, and I've got two functions, little f from A, B to R, and I've got this function, capital F from A, B to R, such that the following happens. So capital F is continuous on the interval, the derivative of capital F is little f. And so again, that says that uh, uh, capital F is an antiderivative of little f for all points in the domain of little f, except maybe not E. So maybe there are finitely many points where this relationship does not hold, and we're cool with that. So we just need this to hold, say, most of the time. You can think of it that way. And uh, also, I need to assume that little f is Riemann integrable over AB. So what is the, uh, the then, the meat of the fundamental theorem of calculus? Then the Riemann integral of little f from A to B is just equal to the value of the antiderivative at the endpoint B minus the value of the antiderivative uh, at the endpoint A. So this is the formula that we are tasked with proving now. But again, you've made it through Calc 1, Calc 2, and Calc 3. You already know this rule. We're just gonna go through why does it hold. So here's the proof. So it suffices to prove this theorem, by the way, in the case that E, remember this finite set of points where maybe the derivative of capital F is not equal to little f. We're gonna prove it in the case that E is just the endpoints A and B. And so to say a little bit about why I can just go to that case, why it suffices to prove that case, well, if E was a handful of points, say X1 through Xn, and when I write these down, let's say I wrote them down so that they're ordered, so that like um, A is less than or equal to whatever X1 is, um, or maybe this should be X0, who knows, maybe I didn't index these quite right. But I'm trying to say these go in order so that uh, there are points that are between A and B, and these points are kind of increasing as I go through A and B. Because if that's the case, a, B then, this interval, would just be the union of all these little subintervals from Xi minus one to Xi. Um, and so what I would do then is I would just try to prove the result. I would give the argument that I'm about to give just on each one of these, where the endpoints of the interval, like I'm trying to say here, truly are the bad points E. And then what I'd probably do at the end is just use the additivity theorem that says the integral of f over ab should be the sum of the integrals over each piece that makes up ab, that would give me the result at the end. Anyway though, so that's just a quick, why does it suffice to prove it, just for this case, that maybe this formula doesn't hold just at the endpoints a and b. All right, so let's let epsilon be bigger than zero. Let's get on with the proof of this. The proof again of assuming all three of these, why does this hold down here? And so let's let epsilon be bigger than zero. And what the goal is gonna be is I'm gonna show you that these two terms, so this term and this term, are within epsilon of each other. And the way that I'm gonna do that is by 
using the definition of what it means for f to be Riemann integral over AB. So if I was to write that down, by hypothesis, f is Riemann integral over AB. So given that epsilon, I know that I could find a positive number delta such that if I find, or if I have any tagged partition P dot of AB, uh, whose norm is sufficiently small, so whose norm is less than delta, remember that means that all of its subintervals have a length smaller than delta, then that guarantees me, again, because f is Riemann integrable, that the Riemann sum of f over that partition is within epsilon of the actual value of the integral, is what this whole thing says here. So let's give p dot a name. Let's say p dot is this partition whose subintervals are, as usual, if you've been watching these videos, xi minus 1 to xi. And let's say its tags are ti. Actually, it won't do anything with the tags ti in this video. I just put them there just because that's what a tag partition is. But really, what's important so far is these are the subintervals that make up the partition of AB. So remember, like x0 would be A, and xn here would be B. All right, so what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to apply the mean value theorem to f. And remember, f is this great continuous function uh, that is also differentiable uh, on a, b, except for maybe not at the endpoints. Cool. So it satisfies the conditions of the mean value theorem. So we're going to apply the mean value theorem of f on each subinterval, xi minus 1 and xi. And remember, what does the mean value theorem say? I'm going to treat this, if you've watched the mean value theorem recently, remember we applied it in the case that I had A and B instead of these, and it said I could find some point C between them. Anyway, I'm just saying, okay, for these endpoints, I could find some point between them such that the difference, capital F of XI minus F of XI minus 1, should be equal to the derivative of capital F at that point UI that's between these two uh, times the difference in these. And remember, that's trying to say that uh, if I was to divide this to the other side, if I divide, that's trying to say the slope of the line between those two points on the graph of capital F, that slope should be equal to the value of the derivative at some point between there. And that's like a really hand wavy way to think about what the mean value theorem is. Remember, I'm going to do this on each subinterval. So I've got a ton of these expressions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add them all up. So again, this is me saying, I've got n of these expressions. I've got n of these equations to play with. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add them all up. So let's think about what that, what that would look like. So if you add up each of these here, I hope that you see this some stuff telescopes. So like when I start with 1, uh, this would be f of x1 minus f of x0, plus the next term would be when i equals 2. So this would be f of x2 minus f of x1. And right away what I hope that you notice is f of x1 minus f of x1, those cancel. And then similarly, you could bet in the next one, right, that's kind of in the dots here, right, f of x2 is going to cancel. I'm going to get a whole bunch of cancellations, and all I'm going to be left with at the end of the day is this minus f of x0 and f of xn. So that's called telescoping. If you've heard of that before, say so that this sum telescopes. We're just left with two or three terms. In this case, just these two terms. Just to remind you too, f of x0 is f of a, and f of xn is f of b. And so what did we just say? This stuff telescopes, we get a whole bunch of stuff in the middle cancels out, and you're just left with capital F of b minus f of a. Now what we're going to do is, that was us saying a little bit about what can we say about the sum of these sides. Now what we're going to do is bring in this whole equation here. That, hey, I know I can replace each one of these on this side with the stuff about the derivative of capital F. So capital F of b minus f of a should be equal to this sum again. So this is what we just justified. That was the telescoping nonsense. But now what we're going to do is we're going to utilize that, hey, I know that each one of these is a statement like this. And so what do I have then? I should have, that should be the sum of, just replace this for these. And now the last thing that I'm going to do is I know that capital F prime, by hypothesis, capital F prime is the same thing as little f. So capital F of ui should be the same thing as little f of ui. So we're going to write that in. And so what does that look like? And these shouldn't go away. This was me having a typo. Just pretend that these are still right here. Sorry about that. But again, I just made that little substitution there, that these two numbers are the same thing. And now what I want everybody to try to notice here is that this, that piece right there, is a Riemann sum. This right here is the Riemann sum of your function f over this partition q dot, where the subintervals are the same as the ones from p dot, but now the tags are just ui instead of ti. And so uh, what else can we say? Well, what, what can we say about the 
uh, I guess maybe to say a little more simply what we just showed, we just showed that f of a minus f of b, uh, it's all equal to this Riemann sum. And so to say that a little more compactly, I just wrote it right here. And the other thing that I can say about this partition q dot, if these are the same sum intervals that were in my partition up here, p dot, and I had assumed that p dot had a norm less than delta, well, if it's the same subintervals, then the length of the subintervals all match, right? And so if the biggest subinterval in p dot is less than delta, well, guess what? The biggest subinterval in q dot is also less than delta. Therefore, q dot and p dot have the same norm. So what does that tell me? That tells me by the definition of f being Riemann integrable, that the Riemann sum of f over q dot ought to be within epsilon of the integral of f as well. And that is exactly what we're about to say. The Riemann sum of f over q dot, since q dot is a partition with sufficiently small norm, has to be within epsilon of f, uh, uh, sorry, of the integral of f, right? I mean, if that wasn't true, then your function wouldn't be Riemann integrable because you found a partition that breaks the definition. That didn't happen though. All right, so why are we happy about that? Well, what do we know is another way that we could write this? What do we just painstakingly go through to write that as? We just said that that is the same thing as f of b minus f of a. So why don't we just substitute that in? This is supposed to say is equivalent to, typos are bad today. So this is f of b minus f of a, just a little substitution there, uh, minus integral of little f from a to b is less than epsilon. In other words, these two terms are within epsilon of each other. Since epsilon was arbitrary, that tells me that those two terms, in fact, have to be equal. And that's the end of the proof for that. So there should be a little, little box there that says we're done with that. So we did it. We proved the first form of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, how do we use it? So let's just kind of review some Calc 1 with a little more detail about how exactly we're using the first form. So if little f is the function x on 0, 1, and if I let capital F be x squared over 2, we're going to notice a few things. And so I'm trying to keep this consistent with a, b, and c as far as the fundamental theorem of calculus is stated up here. So what can I say about capital F? Well, this function, definitely continuous on 0, 1. That's a polynomial. Of course, it's continuous. Uh, b, what happens when you take the derivative of this? We'll use the power rule, right? So the 2 comes down, cancels out the 2 to the bottom, and you get x. But hold on a second. That is the same thing as little f. So that's pretty cool. And that's true for all x in the interval from 0 to 1. So therefore, what is that weird set? If I scroll back up, sorry if I'm making you sick. I just wanted that to hold most of the time, right? It's okay if it didn't hold at a finite number of points. It, hold, it held all the time though in my example, so this E would be the empty set in this case, in this example. And so I think I wrote that here. Since it worked for all x in the interval, then E would be the empty set in the statement of the fundamental theorem. And then finally, if you think about this function here, well, it's a continuous function, and recall that we proved that all continuous functions on a closed bounded interval are in fact Riemann integrable. Therefore, my functions f and capital F, they satisfy all three of the criteria here for the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, so by FTC1, that's short for Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1, what can we say? The integral of little x from 0 to 1 dx should be equal to your antiderivative evaluated uh, from 0 to 1. And what I mean by that is we're going to plug 1 in first minus what we get when we plug 0 in. And so if I write that out, that'll be 1 over 2, so 1 squared over 2 minus 0 squared over 2. And of course, that simplifies to 1 half. So the value of this integral is a half. So now is where we prove that we've got these antiderivative rules or anti-differentiation rules that I can kind of use to evaluate these integrals perhaps a little bit more quickly than trying to use the epsilon definition with these partitions. Now we're kind of in our happy place where we can use Calc 1 again. So to give you a couple more examples, let's say little f is this step function here. It's minus 1 if x is between negative 1 and 0, and it's 1 if x is between 0 and 1. Notice, too, that my function is never defined at x equals 0. Therefore, the domain of little f would be minus 1 to 1, but I'm saying drop out the point 0. Remember, that's a set difference notation. And let's say capital F is the absolute value of x minus 1. Again, notice some things. Absolute value, continuous. Absolute value of x minus 1, also continuous. Therefore, this function is continuous on the interval minus 1 to 1. F prime of x, if you think about differentiating this, we are going to get minus 1 and 1. And uh, in this case, notice that this piecewise function that you get is exactly the same thing as f of x. And uh, where does this hold? This holds for all x that's in minus 1 to 1, except for 0. 
And so in that case, what I'm trying to say here is that E, the set of points where this formula might not hold, right, is just whenever you have the singleton zero. So again, we're happy because E is a finite set. So we're still uh, in the ballpark or in the realm of being able to use the fundamental theorem. And the last thing I need is that F should be Riemann integrable from minus one to one. This piecewise function needs to be Riemann integral. How come? Well, because it's a step function. So it's okay that it's not defined at zero. Uh, it's still Riemann integrable there because it's a step function. Therefore, we can use FTC1 to say that the integral from minus 1 to 1 of that step function should just be equal to uh, my antiderivative, absolute value of x minus 1, again, evaluate it at its endpoints and take the difference. So it's a little bit hard to read, but I'm saying plug 1 in first, that would be this, and then minus will plug in negative 1 second, and that would be this stuff here. And of course, if you do that, it's all the same. You get 0 minus 0, so you get 0. I think I wanted to do one more example with you. We'll call it part C. Let's say capital F is the square root of x on this interval from 0 to 1. So capital F is continuous on 0 to 1. That's pretty cool. Uh, but what's the derivative? Well, the derivative would be 1 over 2 root x, right? And this root x is in the denominator. Therefore, it's only defined uh, for x not equal to 0, but still less than 1. So x between 0 and 1 is what I mean to say, not including 0. So why is that bad? Well, think about if you had a function f that was supposed to match f prime, if it's got to match this formula, well, this thing's unbounded as x gets close to zero. So your function's unbounded. But in that case, that means that no matter how we even defined f of zero to be, there's nothing that we could do to fix it. Little f is never ever going to be Riemann integrable from zero to one. And so I've got a function that's not Riemann integrable, well, therefore, part C of the fundamental theorem of calculus, let's see if I scroll back up. I kind of should have warned you before I just scrolled way up there. Sorry. Well, I'm saying that this is not satisfied. Therefore, I cannot apply the theorem to these functions in this case, or really to this function, capital F. So FTC1 does not apply. So be careful when you're using the fundamental theorem. Be careful that all the hypotheses are satisfied.